Hello, everyone. Welcome to APP to APP virtual lectures. We have two audiences tonight, the APP to APP audience and the audience from my Catholic doctor. My name is Melissa Barahese. I am a nurse practitioner in neurology in the Chicago area. And tonight I will be presenting uh, POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome for primary care. I wanted to explain a little bit about the reason I chose this particular slide deck cover. Uh, when I saw these lollipops, I thought this was a perfect visual to explain um, a little bit about how most people live well with POTS, uh, right? We hear a lot of, I think, myths and sort of worst case scenarios out there. But for the most part, people live well with POTS, uh, as with the orange lollipop. Sometimes we have some exacerbations or flares, and we need to manipulate medications with the green and yellow lollipops. And then off to the side, we have the red lollipop that's not doing really well, maybe or, uh, a little bit early in his or her diagnosis, but I have no doubt that uh, he or she will be joining the rest of the lollipop soon enough. I have no disclosures. So I wanted to start with listing the objectives for this presentation. So first we'll start off with discussing some of the most relevant parts of the nervous system and the neurotransmitters that are most relevant to POTS as well as some of its pathophysiology. Uh, you will be able to gain familiarity with the demographics, uh, prevalence incidence of POTS and some commonly associated comorbidities. You will gain confidence in when to suspect POTS based upon piecing together subjective data as well as objective data, and when and when not to intervene in POTS management. Explain the diagnostic criteria for POTS, including a basic understanding of the diagnostic process. Possess a strong understanding of the commonly used pharmacotherapeutics and non-pharmacotherapeutics to treat and manage POTS and how to provide some basic education to patients. And in addition, how to triage the symptoms or to train staff to do so, again, using both subjective and objective data when patients call with questions, concerns, or a flare in their symptoms. So a little bit about the pathophysiology that uh, one of the main concepts about the pathophysiology that I want you to carry with you for the rest of this presentation is when we stand, we are all subject to gravity. It's nothing that any of us can fight or ignore. Blood will just pool in our legs when we stand. And um, for many of us, you know, for the healthcare providers, right, uh, we've all, um, after an eight or 12 hour shift on our feet, seen swollen legs at the end of the day, right? Uh, but when the effects of gravity are unable to be countered by our autonomic nervous system, um, the blood will just continue to pool in our legs, which means there's impaired venous return to the heart and reduced preload. So we have reduced cardiac output. The baroreceptors, um, some of which are in our carotid arteries, then trigger sympathetic nervous system activity, the accelerator of our nervous system to pick up the pace. At this point, our brain has no idea where our blood is. Our nerves and our legs are not talking back up to our brain to tell the brain to send a signal to the heart to recirculate blood. And so the consequence is that we experience tachycardia and patients will then have a sudden urge to lay down or feel like they're going to pass out. And they often have plenty of time um, to abort that feeling to be able to sit or to or to lie down. So many of us, um, even if you know we don't work in the ED or the IC are familiar with the concept of compensatory tachycardia, right? Um, these patients who are dehydrated or experienced acute blood loss from uh, medical trauma, maybe when their blood pressure is low, they have the reflex tachycardia to compensate, right? To get blood up to the brain and out to the vital organs. But POTS is when your blood pressure is normal, you are normotensive, it's just simply pooling in your legs, and your central nervous system is misunderstanding that. It doesn't know where the blood is, it thinks for all your brain knows your blood could be hemorrhaging out of your body, and so it implements, it triggers that reflex, that reflex tachycardia. A little bit of background on POTS. Again, it stands for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So the operative words there being uh, when you are standing, 
uh, as I had just explained, you experience the tachycardia. And this is a syndrome. Multiple body systems are affected. And you'll understand why in just a minute when I explain a little bit more about the autonomic nervous system and the role that it plays in our bodies. There's an estimate of about one to three million people in the U.S., Living with POTS, it's hard to know for sure. A lot of people go years and years being incorrectly diagnosed or not understanding um, you know, what, what POTS is. They're misdiagnosed for so many years. It predominantly affects females ages 15 to 25. Uh, we sometimes see younger patients in the pediatric population and sometimes a little bit older, but the 15 to 25 group is obviously um, of reproductive age. They're very active um, and, and productive, and it can be very debilitating for that age group. Mom will usually pass it on to daughter. We see it in twin sisters. Um, sisters. Um, again, it sort of spares the male, male line. Um, POTS is a malfunction of the autonomic nervous system, not an autoimmune condition. That is one myth that I wanted to dispel uh, right away, although I will explain a little bit later about why it's not um, impossible to envision that POTS could potentially be um, an autoimmune condition. Uh, and, and POTS does not alter life expectancy or predispose one to other illnesses. A lot of my patients will argue, uh, you know, well, if I fall and hit my head, then, you know, that's that's quite an injury. And that's not unfair. Um, but again, one another myth that I like to dispel is people living with POTS for the most part, um, when I'm listening in the history, if they are passing out frequently, um, including when sitting or laying down, I, I sometimes think of another differential diagnosis other than POTS. You can certainly pass out with POTS, but it's not as common as we, we all may hear. So I wanted to give a brief overview of the autonomic nervous system. It's part of the nervous system that we don't learn very much about um, in school. And autonomic, you can think of the word automatic. It controls the things that we don't think about. It's one of the first parts of the nervous system that forms in utero. And you can think of it as the part of the nervous system that triggers us to fight or flight or run from the bear, as they say, survival of the fittest. If we don't sense fear, we won't survive. And we are where we are as a species because of our autonomic nervous system. And so again, some of those things that it will control uh, without us giving it any thought, our metabolism, digestion, relaxation of smooth muscle, vascular muscle, uh, exocrine and, and endocrine functions. Two other important parts of the nervous system to understand are the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches. Now, there are some nuances um, in terms of the neurotransmitters um, that are that play a role in each of these branches and what in terms of what each of these branches do in, ter in terms of accelerating or relaxing our nervous system. But for the purpose of today, I want you to think of the sympathetic branch as the accelerator, as the go, go, go. You are fleeing or fighting. And the most important neurotransmitter to consider there is noradrenaline, or some more commonly we know it as norepinephrine. And this is different from the adrenaline that our adrenal glands spit out. This is a neurotransmitter that lives in our sympathetic nerves, and it helps aid in cardiovascular tone and blood pressure. When you are fighting or fleeing from that bear, your blood pressure, your vessels constrict, and that blood pressure is up to, uh, so that you can run quickly from the bear or fight. Um, now, one exception to uh, one other neurotransmitter that is involved in the sympathetic nervous system is acetylcholine, but only to activate the sweat glands. Again, when we're running from the bear, we need um, our sweat glands to produce sweat to keep our bodies cool from when we're running to avoid becoming overheated. So examples of sympathetic nervous system overactivity are um, sweating, heart rate, and blood pressure increase. Uh, we're trembling, bowel and bladder zip up. There is no time to go to the bathroom when you are running or fighting the bear. Your appetite is turned off. Um, you will feel goosebumps and your pupils will dilate to scan that horizon for danger. Think very primal evolutionary instinct that we have here. Now, in contrast, the parasympathetic branch we can think of as rest and digest. The primary neurotransmitter there is acetylcholine. 
And the fibers that release acetylcholine are considered cholinergic and they aid in secretions. I had just mentioned that acetylcholine aids in sweating, for example, in the sympathetic nervous system. It also helps control our heart rate, um, urination, again, fluids in the body and our pupil function. So examples of when the rest and digest part of our nervous system is in overdrive, our heart rate will drop. We will be teary-eyed, we will be salivating, um, bowel and bladder open up to diarrhea, urination, and meiosis. Um, we don't have any need to fight or flee, so our pupils sort of calm down and constrict. There's no more need to scan the horizon for danger. We will see later that um, when we start talking about management of POTS, you'll want to give some thought and some critical thinking to what it means for patients living with POTS when you're thinking about noradrenaline and acetylcholine, for example. So some of the most common triggers that I hear in history, ever since I passed out at the gym, ever since I delivered my baby, ever since I had the flu, these are major events in our lives that alter our cardiovascular status, our hemodynamic status, especially when they don't go well, for example, if there's been a lot of blood loss. Now, the other thing to consider is uh, acute change in cardiovascular conditioning. I'll often hear patients say, I used to run marathons, and then I got married, got a new job, and became pregnant, and that marathon running start, suddenly started tape, to taper off. Was someone living with POTS and it was staved off because they were so well-trained from a cardiovascular standpoint, and now the POTS is bursting through? Uh, that would that would be my main question, but again, it's a common trigger that I hear from patients. Um, infection. So uh, COVID, I'll just use the most recent example. Uh, was COVID causing POTS or unmasking it? Uh, were, um, given that there's a, uh, some sort of genetic relationship, mom often passes it to daughter, for example, were they sort of genetically predisposed and then COVID came along and um, tinkered with the autonomic nervous system, fight or flight mode to fight off an infection? Um, it's not really clear. So as of right now, there isn't enough evidence to call POTS an autoimmune condition. Uh, there are some antibodies out there to the acetylcholine receptors, to our alpha and beta antibodies or autoantibodies. Uh, people who do not have POTS also have these antibodies, and only a small percentage of people living with POTS have these antibodies. In addition, uh, the labs and assays really are not standardized. So, for example, any of us can send a CBC and CMP to a lab in California, Minnesota, and Florida, and within 0.1 or one point value, we'll get roughly the, the same values or results back. With these labs and assays, they are just not standardized, so they really do not prove um, very helpful in diagnosis and most often just lead to more questions and cause more anxiety in patients. And then finally, we have some aggravate, aggravating factors. So heat, dehydration, stress, large meals. Uh, now, uh, just to be clear, no, you will not get POTS after eating a large meal, um, but I'm simply uh, separating out the aggravating factors from POTS because sometimes we just hear those things. We don't hear this one big trigger um, ever since I delivered my baby or ever since I had COVID. It's more like I don't do well at the gym when I feel really overheated in the yoga room, when I'm really worried about my final exams coming up. Um, I get really dehydrated. If I get, I have to carry a water bottle around. If I get really dehydrated, I'm down for the count for three days. Now, the large meals, I do want to explain a little bit further um, for people who do live with POTS. Um, what's going on there is when we eat a large meal, we can all sometimes feel tired after a large meal, right? All of that blood shunting to our gut. Again, remember for people living with POTS, that blood shunting to the gut, the motherboard already doesn't understand how to circulate blood. There's a misunderstanding on where the blood is in the body. So imagine after a large meal, shunting all of that blood further to the gut and POTS symptoms can be exacerbated. So I just always encourage my patients to eat um, many small meals throughout the day, a carb paired with a protein to slow the digestive process. So. When we are listening for some of the most common signs and symptoms of POTS, you'll notice that I've labeled this as subjective data. Next, we'll talk about objective data, which arguably is probably most important 
when taking an HPI. Sometimes patients come to clinic with that data. Sometimes you can capture it um, in real time in the clinic or send them home and have them send it back to you. But for now, we're starting with the subjective data. Patient has come into clinic, they'll complain of lightheadedness, um, feeling like they're going to pass out. They'll feel diaphoretic. Um, people will tell them they're pale and they will experience something called coat hanger pain. The pain will start in the back of their head and neck and spread out into their shoulders in the shape of a coat hanger. It's not really clear um, uh, the mechanism for why that happens. Uh, it's thought that we have a lot of stretch receptors in the base of our brain and the basal arteries, um, and they're being pulled on as the gravity pulls blood down to our feet when we stand, triggering us to feel pain. Remember, pain is a function of the nervous system, right? It's something that comes for our brains, from our brains to warn us that something is wrong. Sit down, lie down, stop what you're doing and pay attention to why you have this pain. The uh, other symptoms that we usually hear are chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitations. Again, the chest pain mechanism is not really clear. It may just have something to do with uh, the nervous system sending a signal to the heart. It's working in overload with that reflex tachycardia. You need to sit and rest and listen to your body. Your body is really smart. It will tell you when you need to sit and rest when something isn't right. Uh, you'll also experience or, or hear frequently from patients GI dysfunction, usually constipation, early satiety. They will eat one bite of food and feel completely full, um, bloated, belching. You'll sometimes hear difficulty swallowing, nausea. Remember, when you're in fight or flight mode and your brain has triggered your heart into reflex tachycardia, there is no time to eat or go to the bathroom. Your brain is not sending a signal to those leptin and ghrelin hormones to eat or you know, to stop eating or, or manipulating your appetite. There is no time. You have to run from that bear. So again, patients also experience urinary retention. Um, they'll experience extremity tingling, venous pooling. Again, the blood is shunting really quickly. Um, you'll, they'll have uh, color change in their hands, feet, the dependent, the venous pooling. Um, they'll look purple, red. The veins will look engorged distally. And they'll feel pretty panicked and anxious. And a lot of times, um, especially with young women, they are dismissed and placed on anti-anxiety medications. It is really hard um, to see a young woman go in and have all of these symptoms wrong, right? Every bodily system is wrong. And I see a lot of patients come into the autonomics practice just misdiagnosed with a, um, as anxiety or panic disorder and given a benzodiazepine. So at this point, I always like to pause here, because as we're listening to patients' history, right, all of us are already thinking about what are some differential diagnoses. And so some of the ones that I, um, get, especially even with my experience in autonomic neurology, I still think about a lot of non-neurological diagnoses. What else could this be? We constantly ask ourselves as providers. So the first thing I think of is anemia, um, especially in young women. Uh, cardiac etiology, um, you know, vasovagal syncope, um, inappropriate sinus tachycardia or SVT, um, always very high in the differentials, right? Rather uncommon in, in younger patients, but always something to think about, maybe something congenital. Adrenal insufficiency, endocrine disorders, hyperthyroid, um, diabetes. Uh, we always think about a phaochromocytoma, a lot of the symptoms of fight or flight, right? We think about something endocrinological or adrenal. Uh, now, dehydration, hypovolemia, these can just be lifestyle habits that patients have. They don't drink enough, um, but, uh, you know, blood pressure runs low. Um, that often does require further workup, though. Why is blood pressure running that low to feel all of these symptoms? And of course, I would argue that any of these diagnoses, of course, requires further workup. There are lots of different types of anemia, for example, if you're worried about that. And then finally, I cannot stress enough medication reconciliation, medication reconciliation, medication reconciliation. Um, patients are taking things um, that they sometimes don't feel that they need to share with providers or feel that they're really benign. Um, and so diuretics, vasodilators, again, not very common in the um, younger population, um, but there are things used off-label for different reasons. Um, 
you know, tricyclic antidepressant stimulants. Um, those are sort of the big four, but you always want to ask patients what they're taking, even vitamins, supplements, and think about, again, are these anticholinergic? Are they um, stimulants where are we overproducing an adrenaline, a high adrenaline state? So again, thinking back to that slide of the importance of those neurotransmitters in the autonomic nervous system, is this syndrome a medication, a, an effect of a medication this patient's taking? So next, we move on to objective data. Now, orthostatics are going to be the most important piece of data after you gather this subjective data from the patient. And often in clinic, if we saw a new patient for POTS, I would get these orthostatics right there in clinic. If there were some other complicating things, like a patient was taking a certain medication, I would send them home to send me this data later. So two very important pieces of education that you're going to want to consider. If you get this data in clinic uh, from your RN or medical assistant, make sure that that process is consistently capturing that data in clinic, that you have a protocol in clinic, lie, sit, stand, waiting three minutes in between capturing blood pressure and heart rate. Now, if you send a patient home to gather that data, what you're going to tell them is gather your blood pressures and heart rates in this order with a blood pressure cuff that most patients have at home um, that they can bring back into the clinic and we can calibrate for them. And they're going to want to take medications, um, their orthostatics, one hour after any medications that they take, or if they don't take any, the best time of day to take their orthostatics is in the morning. And then please bring this data to clinic with you um, for your next appointment or send it to me on my chart or your electronic medical record, whatever your clinic protocol is for patient communication. Uh, usually, I, I don't have too much of a preference for blood pressure cuffs. I do think arm cuffs are the best, um, and Omron and McKesson usually can get over the counter on Amazon for a pretty reasonable, um, pretty reasonable amount. Uh, and again, the protocol that I follow is I usually have patients lay down for five minutes, capture blood pressure and heart rate, sit up for five minutes, then repeat and then stand for five minutes and repeat gather, gathering that, that same data. A lot of patients will take these out of order. They will stand first because that's when they feel uh, the, the most unwell, right? Um, and then they'll take it sitting and then laying down, but it has to be taken in this order. And when we talk a little bit about the diagnostics, um, you'll, you'll understand why. And again, POTS is worse when you're standing, right? So we would expect, um, uh, your heart rate to be worse or higher when you're standing. So we're looking for that pattern. So at this point, uh, now that we know how to capture diagnostic criteria when you, uh, and the uh, objective, uh, objective data, excuse me, from your patients for the orthostatics, you're then going to take a look at the diagnostic criteria for POTS. So the 30 beats or more per minute is the um, amount of increase that you need to see in the heart rate when a patient goes from laying to standing. Um, for younger patients, it's 40 plus beats per minute. And it needs to be sustained over the course of 10 minutes. This next bullet is very important. This tachycardia must be occurring in the setting of normal tension. There is no hypotension to explain that reflex tachycardia. The uh, symptoms and their objective data, their orthostatics is not explained by medication side effects, right? Uh, there is a protocol for the TILT test uh, to hold certain medications if, if applicable uh, a few hours or a few days before the test if necessary. And then there is also more presyncope and less actual syncope. So again, when patients are constantly passing out, we think a little bit more about vasovagal syncope. Uh, and then finally, the symptoms are worse when standing. Uh, they improve when a patient is recumbent. So these are the diagnostic criteria in POTS 
Um, and again, all of the items that you um, could and should be gathering as part of your subjective and, and objective data. And the final thing that I wanted to say is I get a lot of questions about the different types of POTS or patients will ask me, what type of POTS do I have? The most important thing to know is that most, there are three different types of POTS, um, but ultimately at the end of the day, we're dealing with the same thing. Um, we're dealing with a tachycardia that needs to be controlled using a combination of pharmacotherapeutic and non-pharmacotherapeutic uh, actions. So really, um, and I'll get into that a little bit more when we get into talking about treatment and management. So for the exam, um, again, young women, young men, the exam really is mostly normal, um, but there are a few very common findings. Um, one thing that you'll sometimes find is as soon as you walk in the room, um, you'll see the patient sort of sitting with pretzel legs. Um, I'll have to find a good picture of this, but you're basically uh, have your legs crossed and then that top foot further tucked behind the bottom leg that's placed on the floor. So the legs are really sort of double crossed. Um, and it's sort of a, a reflex habit that people don't even really know that they're doing so that when they go to sit, the blood stays shunted upwards when they sit. Um, they'll also sometimes look fatigued or they'll also sometimes look really anxious that can wax and wane. Remember being in fight or flight mode, you're going to feel anxious, but it's also really exhausting after the fact, right? So uh, the other things that I'll see are the pupils are usually really dilated if they're sort of in this anxious mode and pop up out of the chair and, you know, can't wait to find out what their diagnosis is and share their story and their journey. They're tachycardic. They feel palpitations just sitting there. Um, they look diaphoretic. They're sweating right through their clothes onto my exam table. Uh, they will be tachycardic, of course, when you auscultate them. Uh, you'll see sometimes the venous pooling, hands and feet uh, look mottled, purple, purple red, especially when they're sitting on the exam table, those enlarged distal veins and the feet dependent um, color changes. They also um, can look like, um, can be hypermobile or have the soft doughy skin um, that you can usually tell when you've seen enough patients living with POTS. Um, and hypermobile uh, meaning that, um, you know, there is a common comorbidity with POTS, um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. They've been dislocating, um, you know, joints since they were kids. They went to go scratch their back and dislocated their shoulder accidentally. Um, they have really, really stretchy, soft, doughy skin. Um, it doesn't change anything about what I'm going to do or not do with the POTS, but it's just another piece of the puzzle, right? As um, clinicians, we have to use all of the puzzle pieces that we can when we're coming up to make as strong of a case as we can and as thorough a case as we can to make a diagnosis. And so seeing that um, EDS type presentation um, would be supportive of POTS. Um, again, the pallor um, modeling, soft doughy skin um, and EDS, as I had just explained in the paleogenic papules um, that I've circled there um, also can be, can be common as well. So as a quick summary at this point, um, for providers who are not specialized in neurology or autonomic neurology, during an HPI, again, you're going to hear patients throwing every system is wrong at you, right? And that can be really overwhelming as providers. But the things that you're really listening for, a few items in the subjective data, those common triggers, right? A big major hemodynamic cardiovascular event in their lives, um, multiple system complaints. They've seen multiple specialists without a clear etiology, or maybe they do have something else wrong, right? People can have more than one thing. Um, but I often find, for example, when patients have been diagnosed with um, SVT or um, with IBS, it might actually truly be the POTS talking. Uh, and then of course, we're using the objective data as well, right? So they've either brought to clinic or you have sent them home or in clinic have gathered that orthostatic data, that objective data. Did their heart rate climb 30 beats or 40 beats or more per minute if they were ages 12 to 19 in the setting of being normotensive? 
and they felt better when they laid down. So, and again, the exam is mostly normal. You'll see some venous pooling, diaphoresis, some of the skin and joint changes um, that you'll notice um, that correspond more so with EDS. So some of the diagnostics. Uh, now, as clinicians, we all know that a good history and exam can tell us a lot, right? And luckily in autonomics, we do have some really thorough testing to help us with the diagnostic process. And then sometimes we also use a response to therapy as well to see how patients are doing, right? To work backwards um, using a medication as a diagnostic. So some of the most important ones in autonomics are the tilt table, Valsalva, sweat test, and pupillometry. Some of the other diagnostics that we use less commonly are ambulatory blood pressure cuff. Uh, brain imaging, I really get very rarely. It's if I suspect uh, something else um, in a young woman who has maybe put on a lot of weight. Um, that's a, a red flag for me to think about. I mean, it has vision changes uh, and headache. It's a red flag for me to think about idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Um, you know, uh, swallowing, nausea. Um, I think of Chiari, um, if it's out of proportion to what I see in POTS, but it's it's really honestly very rare um, that I have to get brain imaging. And usually these patients have had it done already because autonomic neurology um, has been their, their 10th stop. They've already had been imaged somewhere along the way. Some of the other non-neurological diagnostics that I think of um, result from the HPI, right? So I'm listening in HPI and when I'm thinking of my differentials, there may be other things that I want to rule out if they haven't already been done. Again, a lot of patients, I need to make sure there's not something else going on, right? But again, a lot of patients have already been to endo. For example, they've had cortisol levels, thyroid, um, but I will draw those, urine, sodium, blood sugar. If they are abnormal, I will refer to endo, primary care um, for further management, of course. Um, and then I, of course, do a quick bait and score during the visit as well, um, which is uh, sort of part of the exam, um, but something to think of. This is the very, very quick version. Um, their thumb for EDS will bend all the way back to their wrist. I am not hypermobile, so I cannot do it. Uh, the pinky will bend back to 90 degrees. Again, I'm unable to do that. The elbows or hyperreflexic, um, the uh, hyperextend, excuse me, the knees, uh, similarly, the spine, they can bend over and touch the floor without bending their knees, palms flat on the floor, and their skin is very, very stretchy, soft, doughy skin. There's pictures out there of people pulling their facial skin in all sorts of directions, um, and they've dislocated a, um, very frequently from an early age. And so, um, obviously, as I had just said, if these patients have not already seen these other specialties, and especially if there's an abnormality in, in one of these, I will, of course, refer the patient out in, in that regard. And then I will proceed with, um, if they're formally diagnosed with POTS, of course, with managing the POTS. So the most important thing that autonomics uses to diagnose POTS is the tilt test. And I really love this pictorial because um, we start out, first of all, in the supine position. And then uh, we strap the person in um, so that they're safe when we tilt them up. And they're connected to usually a few blood pressure cuffs with a lot of equipment that is measuring several things, their heart rate, their blood pressure, their systemic vascular resistance, and their cardiac output. We then tilt them up for about 10 minutes. Remember that diagnostic criteria tells us that they have to have sustained tachycardia of 30 to 30 beats per minute um, or more for sustained over a 10 minute period. And then we return them to supine, supine position. And usually the findings there, um, as you may have guessed by now, are uh, supine in supine position, uh, heart rate and blood pressure are uh, normotensive, uh, normal heart rate within 60 to 100 beats, maybe slightly tachycardic. Uh, sometimes patients are a little nervous uh, taking the test. Uh, and then when we stand them up or tilt them up, they, uh, of course, we see the blood pressure remains stable, uh, maybe a quick change that returns to normal tension after one to three minutes. And then we have, um, uh, we see the tachycardia. 
Now, the sweat test is also another important piece of the workup. Usually there is a strap attached to the lower extremity, for example, um, with uh, using a test called the QSART um, to evaluate the pseudomotor or the sweat function. It stimulates the sweat glands. Um, it's a rather uncomfortable part of the test, uh, an unpleasant sensation to stimulate those sweat glands. And then the amount of sweat or humidity that is put out um, is measured by a hygrometer and translated against the normative data for how much uh, sweat should be produced. That usually is done because it's a rather unpleasant sensation while the patient is laying down on the table and completed before we tilt them up. Now, the value in looking at the sweat test is we're looking for something called a small fiber neuropathy. Remember, when we stand, the motherboard, the nervous system, is looking for where all of our blood is. And we have these big nerve boulevard and pathways going right down to the tips of our fingers and toes. Those nerves in our toes and legs, for some reason, are not sending the signal back up to the brain hey, it's time to recirculate blood. We've been standing for a long time now. And so the question becomes, why aren't the nerves doing that? What's happening down in the feet and legs? Is there a small fiber neuropathy? It's relatively uncommon in the younger generation, but some causes of a small fiber neuropathy, one of the most common ones that we can think of is diabetes, for example, that stocking glove pattern. Um, causing the pins and needles and tingling, and the nerves just are not sensing, um, not taking in sensory input in the way that they should be to talk back up to the brain to recirculate blood. The other test that we do is something called pupillometry. It looks like a camera that's placed over the eyeball. It measures pupillary diameter, the rate at which it constricts in response to a flashing camera light, and the rate at which it redilates when that camera source is removed. And this, of course, is testing the sympathetic and parasympathetic function. Remember in the first slide on patho and the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, the accelerator, the go, 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 is telling you to dilate that pupil, to scan that horizon for danger. And then when you are out of danger, your pupil constricts again, right? Um, so we think a, a little bit about um, so, so this pupillometry test tells us a little bit about how quickly the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems are, are reacting and behaving. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention, I, I don't have a separate slide on this, but there is something called a Valsalva maneuver um, that is done also while the patient is laying down on the tilt table. Um, you can think of it, uh, probably the easiest way to explain it would be uh, something like an incentive spirometer. They're blowing into a tube um, and they're watching a bevel rise and lower. And what we're doing on those monitors, in addition to monitoring their um, blood pressure, heart rate, systemic vacuum vascular resistance and cardiac output, we're looking at what's happening with the heart rate in response to that deep breathing. So again, when we're taking a deep breath in, we're altering that intrathoracic pressure and the heart rate should go up, right? So we're looking for ways, um, we're looking at many, many ways using non-invasive methods um, the pinprick um, sensation from the sweat test is just uh, mildly unpleasant, but not invasive. Um, we're using a lot of non-invasive methods to tell us a lot of information of how the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems are responding or not responding. So this would be an example interpretation that you would receive back from an autonomic neurologist. Head up tilt test revealed excessive rise in heart rate without hypotension or in the absence of hypotension. Uh, pupillometry normal, pseudomotor function suggestive of small fiber neuropathy. Often you will see the pupillometry is normal in younger patients with POTS and often the pseudomotor function may be, may be normal as well, but sometimes we also see a, a small fiber neuropathy. They don't necessarily need to have that finding on the sweat test for a diagnosis of POTS. 
So now I wanted to move a little bit into treatment. And again, as clinicians, uh, much like when we're going through the diagnostic process and have to put the pieces together with a good history and exam, um, regardless of the fancy diagnostic tests that we do or don't have. Um, similarly with treatment, it's comprehensive. We are using a combination of medications, uh, lifestyle changes, as well as rehab and again, treatment or referrals to other providers when there are other comorbids going on. And the good news is that in many cases, and obviously aside from allergies, there's really no wrong combination, no wrong medication to try or combination of these above uh, treatment methods. The patients uh, will vary widely. If you lined up 10 of my patients living with POTS, uh, four are on one medication with uh, three different doses, uh, another three are on uh, three different beta blockers, and another two may not be on any medications at all. Um, you know, they may just be using some uh, non-pharmacological uh, lifestyle changes, and then, um, you know, the last one, several others may just be using um, uh, beta blockers, just maybe only as needed. And I like to rely, there are lots of medication options that we'll get into in a minute. I like to rely on the thought process that we all use, which is relying on a little bit of critical thinking, uh, looking at the allergies, past trial and error, patient preferences. Uh, for example, if you know, you're thinking about a medication that's three times a day with a short half-life and the patient's not really interested in that, guess what? The patient's not going to take that medication, right? Uh, and then looking at, sometimes it really is just trial and error. Um, often I have to try two beta blockers um, or a beta blocker in another category of medication. Um, it's very rare to have to go down the line to try three or, or four things. So, the first pharmacotherapeutic that we're going to cover is Vabradine, and then we'll talk a little bit about beta blockers. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some other categories, volume expanders, uh, with a question mark there, which you will see why when we get to that slide. And there are a few other stragglers that are used sometimes, um, or, or very rarely, only when there are um, severe allergies or contraindications to the medications most commonly used for POTS. So Evabradine um, blocks the hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide gated channel in the pacemaker of the heart or the SA node. And I really love this medication because it's very heart selective as the mechanism of action tells you. So it's very well tolerated. Um, it's not going to a lot of different parts of the body or operating systemically to cause a lot of side effects and it can help chest pain. And again, the mechanism of chest pain is not really well understood other than being in fight or flight mode, your nervous system sending a signal uh, with pain to sit down or slow down, listen to what's going on in your body, right? Um, but the interesting thing about the HCN medications or category is that there are actually four different types of HCN, HCN1, 2, 3, and 4, and they're found throughout all different parts of our body, including in the peripheral nervous system. So given that POTS is a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, again, it would seem right that your nervous system is smart enough to send signals of pain, um, to sit down, slow down. And we may even actually be seeing uh, H HCN medications used for chronic pain management, which is obviously beyond the scope of this lecture, but I, I just thought that was an interesting fact about the HCN category. Some of the side effects that I look for or evaluate uh, before I initiate the medication is QT prolongation, especially if patients are on other QT prolonging agents. Um, if they're taking, uh, sometimes there's congenital a QT prolongation as well if they're on antidepressants or other things. Um, and obviously when we're slowing heart rate, we look out for the opposite effect, right? Just wanting to avoid becoming bradycardic. This is why we start slow and uh, start low and go slow with medications that we implement, right? Um, so again, to avoid uh, exacerbating or causing QT prolongation, I just get an EKG before initiating a Babardine. Now, um, 
again, the patient may have likely already seen cardiology and probably has a fresh EKG. And if it's been done within the last several weeks, then I will gladly accept that and not have to put them through getting another EKG again. Now, the one caveat with this medication is it's actually FDA approved for heart failure in the US, so it can be hard to access. I usually send my patients to a website of the Canadian Pharmaceutical Association. This can be also additionally challenging because most practices, uh, because of our licenses and scope of practice, cannot send prescriptions to Canada. Um, but usually, but we can of course hand it to a patient, um, you know, either through the medical record or it, uh, back in the old, like back in the olden days of paper prescription um, that they can send to their pharmacy in Canada. It's usually very affordable. They can get three to six months at a time, um, but that is one thing to consider with Evabradine. Sometimes the insurance companies will allow me to justify it. Um, sometimes an insurance company will ask uh, that the patient go through a, a cardiologist, which again can also be pretty tricky unless the cardiologist is comfortable managing the POTS. Usually we like to understand the condition we're treating, um, feel safe doing so, and, and manage it with the medication that we're, that we're comfortable prescribing. So before we get onto the beta blockers, again, just going briefly back to the pathophysiology um, of where these alpha and beta receptors are, what happens when they're activated, right? So, and this will help um, help jog our memories when we start talking about these um, alpha and beta medications on subsequent slides about what they mean for someone living with POTS and the effects that these medications have on their autonomic nervous system. So friendly reminder, alpha-1 receptors are uh, found in the heart and they constrict vascular smooth muscle. Alpha-2s are found in the brain and they inhibit norepinephrine, uh, that go-go-go part of the sympathetic nervous system, right? The beta-1 receptors also in the heart, they increase that cardiac output. And then the beta-2 receptors found in the lungs and the heart, they relax bronchial smooth muscle, relax vascular smooth muscle. Um, and also, you know, one of the reasons we avoid a lot of beta blockers, there are um, some safer than others. In pa patients living with asthma, we want all of their beta receptors to be open and not blocked um, when they're living with, with asthma. So, Again, the mechanism of action for the beta blockers is antagonizing that noradrenaline. We want to slow down that sympathetic nervous system. For example, in psychiatry, um, providers will often use propranolol, right, for panic disorder or fear of public speaking to reduce that fight or flight mode. And some of the benefits of beta blockers, they've been around a long time. They're generally cost effective, except for the um, most new, uh, the newest beta blockers. And they're generally fairly well tolerated, especially the water soluble ones, which we'll um, parcel out in, in a minute on a subsequent slide, differentiating beta, um, the selective beta blockers from the non selective beta blockers. Some of the side effects uh, can include fatigue, insomnia. Hypotension, again, we're always looking out for the opposite intended effect of what we're trying to do, bradycardia, shortness of breath and bronchoconstriction, which we've talked about, and some liver abnormalities. Um, remember, when we're in fight or flight mode, um, the liver will break down glucose, lipids um, to produce energy when we need to fight or flee. Um, I have never seen a LFT abnormality in my patients, especially in the, in the younger ones. And uh, now generally, again, the water soluble agents are the ones that have less side effects like tiredness and fatigue. The contraindications are Raynaud's. Um, we wanna avoid causing um, any constriction of um, you know, the vascular smooth muscle um, when it already happens in patients living with painful Raynaud's. Um, dementia, uh, this, this is a, uh, the jury's sort of out on this. Um, do beta blockers contribute to a you know dementia process? I think there's a lot of other larger variables that um, we need to um, think about that are implicated in, in causes of dementia, um, masking diabetes, and of course, asthma. Now, uh, again, some of the things to consider when we're choosing a medication, there are uh, about over a dozen beta blockers, I believe, 
And I choose one uh, based upon what the patient's current blood pressures are, their allergies, side effect profile, the comorbids. Um, and I always try to use the two birds, one stone. So for example, propranolol is a medication that can be helpful for migraine. It can maybe also serve a patient in POTS, but it's typically administered three times a day. Um, and can drop blood pressure. So if blood pressure is already low to normotensive, I would um, worry about bottoming out the patient um, from a blood pressure standpoint. So I would maybe wanna think about a more um, selective beta blocker. So, so this slide, I wanted to give you an understanding of a little bit more of that treatment process, how I would select a medication uh, based upon the blood pressures, the comorbids that the patient is already living with. So the less vasodilatory blood pressure agents, nabivalol, atenolol, for those young patients who are already, you know, blood pressures are already sort of 105 over 78, right? We don't have much room to bring their blood pressure down. So I'm probably going to give them a less vasodilatory um, beta blocker. Uh, similarly, uh, water-soluble versus lipid-soluble. Now, if a patient, um, maybe a patient, uh, let's say uh, in their 40s, um, they have a little bit of a higher blood pressure, but they're still normotensive. They're okay with taking a medication a few times a day. Um, or we can, of course, we can switch to long-acting beta blockers as well. Um, I'll, you know, I will go ahead and certainly try the propranolol, um, you know, uh, propranolol and atenolol um, tend to also be good for anxiety as well, um, if they can tolerate, um, tolerate uh, the side effects of it. The long acting versus short acting. Um, now I like the um, shorter acting. I'm actually gonna skip down to the last line use in pregnancy. The short acting um, we use often in pregnancy. Um, they have a short half-life, right? Um, the problem is that they are really going to hit you uh, hard blood pressure-wise. So we want to make sure we're not bottoming you out, especially a pregnant woman. That really can be a, a safety issue. Uh, but I think, um, again, most women, uh, most women in pregnancy do really well. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a subsequent slide. Uh, for patients who have a long day, a lot of patients maybe who are um, medical providers on their feet 12 hours a day need something that's a little bit longer acting. They take once a day or twice a day, right? So I, that's why I like the longer acting ones. I ask what they do for a living, what their lifestyle is like. Uh, and then I have the uh, less bronchoconstrictive. So usually for patients living with asthma, I have many patients living with asthma who are on beta blockers, but these more... Um, uh, selective ones, the less bronchoconstrictive ones, nabivalol, basoprolol, atenolol. And again, the, the anxiety, um, propranolol, atenolol. Um, I'm not treating anxiety, um, but if it's hard to know, is the anxiety triggered by POTS as part of flight or fight? It's uh, sort of chicken or the egg. So I, I will wade into treating anxiety in that regard. Um, but otherwise, I, I will, of course, um, refer them as needed to social work or psychology or psychiatry. So these are um, some volumes, volume expanders and pressors that at a few slides back, I had placed a question mark next to them. And the reason that I've done that is because first thing in the presentation, the most important concept that I want you to understand uh, from the pathophysiology and the diagnostic criteria is patients are normotensive. They will often show up on my doorstep. However, having been placed on a volume expander like midodrin or fludrocortisone, um, these are not necessarily the appropriate treatments for these patients. Now, the mechanism of action for midodrin is it is a presser and it stimulates those alpha-1 adrenaline receptors on the vascular smooth muscle, right? Which is not necessarily what we need to be doing. We don't need to be pressing or vasoconstricting anything. Uh, it's about slowing down the heart rate in the setting of normal tension, right? So uh, it is dosed five to 10 milligrams three times a day. So there's a short half-life there. Um, itching, 
urinary urgency are probably the two most common things that I see. Again, effects of the autonomic nervous system, right? Uh, and then the risk benefit in pregnancy, I weigh, I talk frequently with um, maternal and fetal medicine, um, high risk OB, um, about the pros and cons of using Midadrin. Um, occasionally patients living with POTS, they're mostly just sustained on evabradine or beta blockers. There is a rare circumstance where we may use a volume expander if it makes patients feel better. But again, these are really not the go-to or mainstay treatments for patients. Um, so similarly, fludrocortisone, it's a corticosteroid similar uh, you know, to what we produce in our adrenal glands and it helps us retain sodium. It is a once a day medication that you take in the morning. And so some of the um, contraindications that we would, uh, for which we would avoid using this medication if there's diabetes, heart failure, osteoporosis, right? Um, we're giving a steroid to a young woman and um, not doing her any favors in terms of bone health. Um, and again, we just always weigh the risk and benefit in pregnancy, but in any of those conditions. So I certainly have um, a few patients who are living with cardiac conditions, heart failure, and I just talk with their cardiologist. You know, we need to weigh the pros and cons um, sometimes. Uh, and then uh, pyridostigmine, um, this is a medication that I sometimes see used. It's usually not very well tolerated at all. Um, also three times a day, short half-life, and it is about those body fluids, right? So the um, it's a cholinesterase inhibitor. So you are teary, salivating, diarrhea, urinating. Um, it's more commonly used um, and more importantly used in a neuromuscular disorder called myasthenia gravis. And so in that regard, something that should be um, the risk benefit of which should be weighed in pregnancy together with um, OBGYN. Uh, some of the other pharmacotherapeutics that we also use um, much less common and really um, sometimes when we're trying to improve sleep or improve fatigue once heart rate is controlled or when patients are allergic to beta blockers. Um, guanfacine, an alpha agonist. Um, some of you may know this medication is commonly being used in ADHD. It can help with sleep, um, but of course we wanna monitor for bradycardia, sedation, nightmares, dry mouth, and then stimulants. Um, now, the getting into uh, the research on stimulants in fatigue or chronic fatigue syndrome um, is, again, beyond the scope of this uh, presentation. Do they even improve fatigue in the first place? Um, but we um, sometimes use stimulants um, when patients' heart rates and other um, other parts of their POTS, the syndrome have been optimized. We will um, use a small dose of a, of a stimulant. Sometimes patients just need it as a PRN um, on test days, for example, exams in school. Um, and of course, the most common side effect I hear from stimulants is palpitations. Um, much more rarely, sometimes we use calcium channel blockers, diltiazem, verapamil, again, in the event that um, we need to sort of slow down the central nervous system a bit um, when patients are allergic to all of these other above options. So uh, now that we've talked about the pharmacotherapeutics, I want to talk about the non-pharmacotherapeutics. Um, this is almost just as important. Um, I can sort of throw whatever medication um, at POTS that I want, but at the end of the day, we have to sort of change some of our habits, right? As with anything in life, with diabetes, as with any chronic condition with which most people live well, um, for example, um, COPD, hypertension, diabetes, right? There are some lifestyle things, quitting smoking, exercising, things like that. Um, so in POTS, uh, some of those lifestyle changes that we would implement 
are avoiding the triggers. So remember I had explained that the aggravating factors that you're listening for in HPI, exercise plus hot shower plus a big meal. This is the trifecta that I always explain to patients to not avoid, but just parcel out or slow down. So maybe less hot showers, um, putting a stool in the shower so you can sit down, having a protein shake after you work out and then shower and then having a smaller meal um, after the shower. All of these things are, are dilating your blood vessels, right? And when the blood vessels are dilated, we have a reflex tachycardia in addition to the POTS. And so that's why this sort of trifecta of events can make patients living with POTS feel worse. Again, the big meals aren't going to cause or trigger POTS, right? Now, manual maneuvers, this can be really helpful when you've been sitting for a long time. A lot of patients will say, I feel awful after I've been taking an exam for two hours. And I will often write them a letter um, to have untimed testing so that they can get up and walk around every 15 minutes. Um, but they're literally just pumping their fists when they're sitting in a chair. They're getting that blood circulating again, lifting and lowering your heels on and off the floor, calf raises, squeeze those glutes when you're sitting and then get up and squeeze the glutes when you rise from the chair, just get those muscle pump functions to encourage those blood vessels to redistribute blood when you've been sitting down for a long time, such as in school. Uh, and then the, I would argue probably the most important piece of non-pharmacological treatment is endurance training. Now, um, Benjamin Levine is the guru in um, autonomic sciences for um, uh, POTS protocol, for the Levine protocol and POTS endurance training. And it's a 12-week program. Um, most patients after 12 weeks report feeling much better from POTS. So I always manage those expectations, a 12-week time frame of endurance training either on their own if they are athletic and feel comfortable doing this or in the setting of PT. For patients who have never worked out, um, who are deconditioned, sedentary, I will often go the extra mile and set them up with cardiac rehab. And what cardiac rehab does is it offers a safety, a safe environment, a supportive environment with a pat on the back and goal setting and you're monitored. So you can set goals. If you're athletic and you're achieving those 30 minutes of moderate intensity um, exercise most days of the week, like the American Heart Association recommends, um, you've come down with POTS, let's say after COVID, and you're trying to retrain, right? You are not going to go back to jogging 30 minutes on the street right away. You have to start small. The tortoise wins the race, as they say. So you may want to go to PT and goal set. Start with what your heart rate and blood pressure are before you get on that treadmill, and then try 10 minutes of fast-paced walking. See how you feel. Reevaluate. They'll get your heart rate and blood pressure, right? Again, safe, supportive, goal-setting environment. So the, again, the American Heart Association guidelines are 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise most days of the week. Um, now, I recommend that patients, that you with your patient calculate what their target heart rate is going to be. Um, you know, those panels on the treadmills or elliptical machines at the gym, right? How to calculate target heart rate, 220 um, minus their age times 0.85. You know, I, I think the benefit in that is sometimes patients will message me and they'll say, oh my God, my heart rate's 180. Well, for a 20 year old, that might be okay, right? On the treadmill going at max capacity. So something that you're gonna wanna do with your patients, you're gonna wanna give them a guide, right? This is based upon your age, what your max heart rate will be if you are going as hard and fast at your max capacity as you possibly can, right? So, and but also remember they're going to be on a beta blocker. Um, so they're going to be on an agent that may not allow them to achieve that max heart rate, which can sometimes frustrate those who are athletes, right? Um, so again, it's just about managing expectations for patients. 12 weeks, let's calculate your target heart rate. Remember, you're on this therapy that's going to keep you a little bit lower baseline heart rate. So just manage expectations with your patients. I wanted to focus on uh, this special population 
you know, it's uh, women's neurology is really a burgeoning area. And I can't in good conscience talk about a diagnosis that predominantly affects women without focusing on pregnancy. Uh, again, overall, really good news. Most women do really well in pregnancy. Uh, and they have, uh, you know, from that volume expansion, that expansion in blood volume for um, to sustain a fetus. I do still always collaborate with OBGYN, MFM, high risk OB. Um, I almost always know we're going towards labetalol or propranolol, but I still always ask. It's about communication and patient safety, right? Um, and most um, OBs are more than happy um, to hear talk with me and, and appreciate the, the outreach because I know POTS can be can be really scary for the patient and the, the obstetrician. Now, um, some things to consider are um, intrapartum um, when we see a heart rate shoot up, right? Um, that's a really obviously very intense time for the mother. So um, if a heart rate um, stays high, would there be need to panic, right? Is there a bleed somewhere? Is, is there another reason for this distress for this heart rate to be so high? It may just be the POTS. Um, it may help to have an extra bag of IV fluid to help expand that blood volume a little bit. There might not be a need to panic or anything actually wrong intrapartum. So just considering the effect that POTS might have intrapartum. Weighing the risk benefit of beta blockers, I had already mentioned um, reaching out and talking with OB. Usually labetalol and propranolol are the choices. Um, and there is no evidence or very limited evidence to consider um, C-section versus vaginal delivery, epidurals or not, um, or any other types of anesthesia or anesthesia for any um, type of surgical, other surgical procedure um, for that matter that, that um, a male or female may be undergoing when living with POTS. Some of the common comorbidities, I had mentioned some of them, and in when treating POTS, trying to take a two birds, one stone approach. Um, migraine can be a common comorbid. It's unclear if it has to do with the POTS. Again, POTS usually does not predispose you to any other um, illness or neurological illness. It may just be that migraine is so dominant also in young women of younger women of um, the, the most productive reproductive years. Um, so there just might be that relationship between POTS and migraine co-occurring for that reason of the demographics. Um, EDS also can be um, common in POTS. Um, and again, doesn't change what I'm doing. Um, I may want to um, more strongly encourage a patient um, rehabilitate themselves from a POTS standpoint with PT um, because they can also get the benefit of being in a safer environment, telling the PT, hey, I also have Ehlers-Danlos. Can we work on strengthening my hip, girdle, knees, um, knee joints, et cetera? So there may be a benefit um, in that regard to encourage patients to rehab with PT for endurance training, but otherwise my management does not change. I also sometimes see chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. Again, um, I IBS is one. I didn't write that down here, but I often see that again, or these diagnoses that they were misdiagnosed. Um, and this is really truly the, the POTS, the POTS talking, right? So I have, um, I encourage you um, in, if you are in primary to talk to neuro, if you're in cardiology, talk to neuro in primary, um, right? Um, talk to these other providers when you make referrals, let them know what you're doing. Um, POTS, again, there's a, there are a lot of myths out there and what we hear um, are usually horror stories. Um, and patients are, are very afraid. They've been uh, misdiagnosed, dismissed for a very long time. They're afraid of their symptoms until we get them under control. And so if you work in neuro, um, I always try to do my due diligence and at least fax my progress note over, hey, this is what, what's going on and, and what we're doing about it, so that we're all on the same page. Um, but also to please avoid changing um, medications um, when you know, uh, without speaking to the prescriber, right? I, I try to avoid stopping or starting a medication that I know will affect a comorbid in a way that I'm not treating. And so I want to reach out to that provider and understand a little bit more and explain what I'm trying to do and treat without causing another comorbidity to flare for that patient. So uh, I devoted a slide um, specifically for the psychiatric component of POTS, anxiety and depression, 
uh, very prevalent in patients living with POTS. I've already mentioned, um, these are patients who have been misdiagnosed and misdiagnosed and dismissed and dismissed. And so uh, sometimes, you know, are they just truly living with a disorder? If maybe I've gotten the POTS under control, are they truly living with uh, depression or anxiety, which we know commonly co-occur in people living with any sort of chronic illness? Um, do I need to refer them to our neurology social worker, um, to uh, some other talk therapist to help them regain control of those fight or flight modes, the anxiety and depression roller coastering, right? And I provide a lot of reassurance to patients, um, especially when they call to triage. Um, my patients uh, were not living in wheelchairs. That is a myth that is floating around online, um, encouraging others to ask their providers for durable medical equipment for wheelchairs. Disability is extremely rare and uncommon. I sometimes have patients coming me to, in a wheelchair, to me in a wheelchair. Um, they have arrived at that stage. Um, we are usually able, once we get testing and treatment underway and a rehabilitative approach with PT, um, they are able to leave the wheelchair um, behind as a thing of the past. So treating objective findings, I cannot stress enough. While these are patients who have been misdiagnosed and dismissed and certainly afraid of their heart rates just going up a flight of stairs, right, and passing out or injuring themselves, it's extremely important that you as a provider provide that reassurance to them and ask, what are your orthostatics? Sometimes they will say, I don't know. Sometimes they'll say, I'm just looking at my Apple Watch. You have to look at those orthostatics at least 50% of the time or more. I Once I see the orthostatics from the patient, I'm able to provide reassurance and hindsight. Hindsight is 2020, as they say, right? So their heart rate on tilt test may have gone from 70 to 110 and jumped to full 40 beats. And if they send me their orthostatics, they may not still be feeling well, but let's say their heart rate is jumping from 70 to 92. So jumping 22 points is a lot better than 40 points. So we just need to titrate medication or try another one, depending on the context. So using that objective data, I cannot stress enough. The other uh, variable that I like to focus on for patients living with POTS, again, who have gone sometimes many years with incorrect diagnoses, is I teach the concepts of resilience, mindfulness, and perspective. Now, we uh, there are a couple of PhD researchers out there, uh, Jameson, McGonigal, who, have, who are doing a lot of work on the ideas of embracing stress and benefit finding. There is a book by McGonagall called The Upside of Stress that really is a game changer. Finding the upside of whatever stressor we face, stress never goes away. So finding the upside of it or the benefit of it actually takes work. This goes back to the autonomic nervous system, right? So the autonomic nervous system forms very early in utero, survival of the fittest. We need to be able to sense fear in order to survive. So in POTS, we have to unlearn this sense of fight or flight. Not everything is fight or flight or survival of the fittest. So we have to, and, and that's inborn in us. And so we have to work hard to really unlearn that. And spiraling up or spiraling into the positive takes, takes work, right? So I uh, always try to focus on problem solving and promoting resilience um, in my patients. And of course, we all know the data and research on mindfulness and what other more perfect diagnosis than a, a, a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system to incorporate mindfulness into your day. One very simple activity for mindfulness that I love is focusing on the present with all of your senses. So when we live with chronic illness, uh, we know we see commonly in our patients the what if scenarios. What do I do when? What what if this happens? What what it, what happens when I go to on vacation? What if what if? And there's a lot of future thinking 
And so I try to tell my patients to focus on the present. And this can be literally 60 seconds a day um, where they sit uh, maybe uh, with their breakfast and they focus on the present and focus on all of their senses. What do they see? They see the flowers outside of the window. They see the bright orange color of their orange juice. They, what are they smelling? They can smell their cinnamon raisin toast and their coffee. Um, what are they hearing? Uh, they are hearing the rain outside um, or the news on TV. And uh, what are they feeling? They are feeling the soft bathrobe or shirt that they're wearing. Um, and it's okay if something's negative too. I am feeling some pain in my pain in my arm that I bumped yesterday. That's okay. Just focus on the present. And when you are becoming anxious or scared about something to stop and slow down, why am I feeling this way? What truly is the root cause? So that's pre that uh, centering in the present moment can really be a powerful exercise doing it when you do it daily. I always uh, encourage my patients to, while I have them bring some orthostatic data either to the appointment or gather it for me and send it to me, I really avoid uh, using diaries because it really just worsens, um, it, it triggers exactly what I had just explained, right? This sort of perseverating over symptoms, this what if, what if, and focusing too much on your symptoms. And then finally, one trick that I like to use very frequently is motivational interviewing. I love motivational interviewing for every diagnosis. And one uh, brief example of it is if you're not familiar with it, uh, Miller and Rolnick are the gurus. Um, they started writing about this in the 80s. Um, anyone in any specialty can use it. Uh, so given that we're just talking about uh, mindfulness and stress management and resilience, one example is what is one thing that you can try for stress management? And then the patient might say, well, my uh, sister uh, lives up the street and goes on a walk every day, and maybe I can join her for her daily walk and have a walking buddy. And I'll say, great, on a scale of one to 10, how likely will you do it? One being the least likely and a 10 being very likely. And the patient will say any number, let's say a six. And I'll say, that's that's." pretty good. You sound like you're pretty motivated. What gives you, uh, why would you give yourself a six instead of a three? So then you're forcing the patient to uh, identify, self-identify their strengths. Well, my sister and I are really close and I know that she'll really support me in, in walking every day. So uh, for this um, slide, I like to provide, we talked a little bit earlier about um, triage, you know, in the clinic having um, routine consistent ways that you um, gather orthostatics, for example. Um, sometimes uh, RNs or MAs, who, whomever is answering your phone lines, um, POTS can be very overwhelming for them to triage. Again, it's a syndrome all of the, everything's wrong, all of the systems are going wrong. And it's hard for them to sort of focus on uh, how to best help the patient. And again, no surprise here, orthostatic data. What is that objective data? So I always have them go back to the progress note, um, take a look at the tilt test. I, I provided some education to an in-service to the nurses on how to just briefly look at a tilt test and the results. Um, and then I always have them reconcile meds, right? Uh, especially with the Vabradine, the patient will say, my, my POTS is, I'm, st I'm still feeling unwell. They haven't been able to get their Vabradine. It's on the way from Canada or it's not cost effective. Um, and so we have to help patients get access to that medication. So when they have the incorrect meds or they haven't um, started taking them yet, we provide reassurance, right? Review the non-pharmacological things. Um, we start the medication and then in two to three days, we encourage them to send us that orthostatic data for the instructions on education for patients that I provided in an earlier slide. Now, let's say they are taking their correct medications. You are going to ask for orthostatics on your triage line, right? So if they are improved, if their orthostatics are improved, but they're still sort of having symptoms, right? You wonder if it's a side effect of a medication. Are they feeling too tired because of the Evabradine? Is the beta blocker dose too high, right? 
So we may need to change a medication dose or try something different. Is the side effect worse than what we're treating? If their orthostatics, if they're taking the correct meds and their orthostatics have not improved, um, then I try to figure out what time of day they feel worse. Um, usually in the morning POTS is worse. And they'll say something like, I feel great for several hours after my atenolol, um, but the nighttime I start to, or around 3 p.m., I start to feel um, panicked and diaphoretic and tachycardic again. We may just need to titrate their medication, right? Um, and of course, I always rely on old carts, um, onset, location, duration, uh, characteristics, aggravating and relieving factors, timing and severity. Um, if there is another symptom that's going on that I feel if their orthostatics are controlled or um, back to normal, then is this symptom out of proportion with what I normally see in POTS? And, and do I need to refer them to another provider or reassure them or work on some of the non-pharmacological things, okay? And then of course, if they're on their correct medications and they haven't gathered orthostatics all the way over on the right there, encourage two to three days of orthostatics um, for two to three consecutive mornings, or it doesn't necessarily have to be consecutive mornings, it's whenever they have time, um, but lay, sit, stand in that order is very important. So uh, one thing that I always like to bring up when we are triaging is I have a brief story uh, when I went out on vacation and left my in basket in the charge of a colleague. I came back after vacation and she said, oh my gosh, Melissa, I sent three of your patients to the emergency room. They all had chest pain. I thought they all had PEs. And I found that really interesting because in my practice prior to autonomic neurology, I worked in general neurology, and I thought very frequently about these, the ABCs, right? Airway, breathing, circulation, when patients call with chest pain, shortness of breath, swallowing difficulty, these are 911s, right? And then all of a sudden I switch into autonomic neurology and patients calling with chest pain, shortness of breath, swallowing difficulty, right? We talked about the history. These are things that we hear frequently in POTS and they really do not raise a red flag as they had for me um, in the past. Now, having said that, um, just because people living with POTS are typically aged 15 to 25 and we don't automatically think of a myocardial infarction or or something extreme like that, or a PE to send them to the emergency room, you should still, of course, always triage them per your clinic protocol. You know, is there swelling in your lower leg, right? Uh, is one calf bigger than the other? Um, so, uh, you know, are, are you... Um, having difficulty swallowing? Is it related to, you know, itching and swelling in your tongue and mouth? Did you eat something new or take a new medication, right? These, of course, should still be evaluated, but please know that chest pain, shortness of breath, and swallowing difficulty, there's a little bit of that esophageal dysmotility in POTS when we're in fight or flight, right? There's no time to eat when you're running from the bear. So these are common things that you hear in POTS. Um, now, also, you can think of, are these symptoms related to part of the rehabilitation process, a medication side effect, again, shortness of breath, um, if there's asthma and, um, you know, uh, if there's asthma, do we need to try a different beta blocker? Um, but always really at the end of the day, if they haven't already seen cardiology, I will do a stress test, treadmill test, um, GI consult for EGD. Um, if, if I really do, if my nurse gut is telling me that this patient needs further workup. So in summary, uh, I have a, um, you know, I, I hope that I was able to clarify for you when to suspect POTS. Um, the patient will have multi-system complaints, again, that may or may not have come up with an etiology, but often they've seen multiple specialists with no clear etiology for GI upset, nausea, um, urinary um, retention or urgency, um, light sensitivity of big pupils in fight or flight, right, light sensitivity. Uh, they're worse when standing, and of course, the objective data that their heart rate climbs 30 plus points when standing or 40 plus points if they're age 12 to 19. 
And once they're correctly diagnosed and treated, most patients really do live well with POTS and get back to the training that um, they, they were, their baseline cardiovascular status, running five miles a week or spinning three days a week. Or if they were sedentary, they've had to create a rehabilitation program for themselves to feel better. Relying on objective data before altering the treatment plan is one of the most important takeaways from this presentation. Again, these are patients who truly have a syndromic presentation where everything is wrong, but at the end of the day, for you, you have to rely on the orthostatics to guide you in terms of what to do or not do with medications, where to refer, or where not to refer those patients. There are various combinations of medications plus rehab and lifestyle changes that work, except when I made a liar out of myself about avoiding compression when the tilt test showed blood pressure was running a bit high, but otherwise you really cannot go wrong. So I want you to feel comforted in that um, you, you really cannot make a wrong decision here. Um, you know, the wait time in neurology is about 12 weeks, um, the area that I'm from. Um, it can take about a year to see an autonomic specialist. And so sometimes in primary care, um, you're it. So I, I want you to know, um, I want you to have that confidence in knowing that you can pick a, a beta blocker that you might feel comfortable using frequently and that that might be the answer for that patient. And then finally, reassure, manage expectations, coach on stress and resilience, and using motivational interviewing when patients call. So finally, I like to always cover a little bit about what the latest literature or research is in this area. It is um, constantly innovating, and there is really so much movement in autonomic neurology right now. Um, there is some research being done on whether patients with POTS may have some degree of insulin resistance. Um, remember I had mentioned that large meals, um, that shunting of blood to the gut, um, patients can feel um, sometimes worse after eating. Um, there are also a lot of patients, uh, not with POTS, but who live on a different end of the autonomic dysfunction spectrum who have low blood pressure um, after they eat, again, the shunting of the blood. Does this have something to do with insulin resistance? So there's um, some research being done about using metformin and other medications to see if it, it, it can help some of that autonomic dysfunction uh, relative to eating and mealtime. Uh, the uh, first clinical trial of Evabradine has been shown to improve POTS and reduce the symptoms and improve quality of life. This is huge because as I had mentioned with Evabradine in this country, it's currently only approved for heart failure. So the fact that we can have this data speaking to the benefit that Evabradine has for POTS, not only symptoms, but the social and physical quality of life is, is huge. Quality of life, um, these questionnaires are being increasingly used um, by insurance companies because it's about a person's functional status, right? In migraine, for example, um, insurance companies have started asking for the MIDAS score, the migraine disability questionnaire score. It's about um, how well a person is able to, to function in life. And then finally, there's some interesting work being done on uh, the role that the renin angiotensin system plays in POTS, um, namely as it relates to COVID, um, but even, um, you know, thinking about the role that the renin angiotensin system plays in um, regulating blood volume and vascular resistance, right? Constricting um, angiotensin, ACE, the, the role of constricting and dilating blood vessels. Um, does a virus like COVID upset that balance of the renin angiotensin system, that very fine tuned system and trigger um, the sympathetic nervous system to just run overactive? So those are some of the things that are on the horizon for POTS and hopefully some additional um, pharmacotherapeutic um, avenues for, for patients to be able to, to take. So I liked to end with 
a case study. Um, and I thought that this is a, a very common, it's a mix of a couple of different patients um, that I've seen, um, but very common presentation, a 25 year old who delivered her first baby six, a month, six months ago by C-section is experiencing lightheadedness after prolonged standing, sitting down, having a salty snack help. Otherwise she will go on to experience further symptoms of nausea, sweating, palpitations, and panic. Coworkers have told her she's pale, her hands and feet appear purple red. She recalls having passed out twice in her teens in the setting of exertion in gym class. Since uh, postpartum uh, delivering her baby, she's noticed more constipation and GI upset. Uh, symptoms worsened after she had the flu three weeks ago. Blood pressure readings at home are normotensive. Her Apple Watch is showing pulses in the 110s when she feels her worst. She denies loss of consciousness, unintentional weight change, polydipsia, weakness, twitching, mood swings. Prior workup includes CBC, CMP, uh, notable for BUN 22, hemoglobin 12.1, otherwise unremarkable B12 and TSH are within normal. Uh, sleep is poor. She does have a six month at home, uh, high stress, poor hydration, uh, good appetite, uh, balanced, but eating less meat recently. Um, prior to pregnancy, she was a long distance runner and practiced yoga and hiked regularly. And she works in retail. So these are her orthostatics, normotensive blood pressures, and we are seeing that her heart rate shoots up by 33 beats from supine to standing. So some of the signs and symptoms of POTS here, and some of those symptoms that would lead us to think about differential diagnoses. So we'll go back to this case study. So some of the signs and symptoms, right, we're already hearing, first of all, a little bit about this trigger that's setting off a flag for us, right? Hmm. She had a C-section, maybe ask her a little bit about how that went. Um, but we do know pregnancy already creates a lot of hemodynamic status changes. Um, she was a long distance runner. Um, she had stopped um, while she was pregnant. So she also had an acute change in her cardiovascular status. Um, her lightheadedness um, and these symptoms are worse when standing, sitting down or having a salty snack help. And she's also um, worsened since getting the flu, uh, an acute infection, another trigger to worsen her symptoms, right? From her history here, we don't have enough information on her um, blood pressures and heart rates, but we see that um, she, for the most part, appears to be normotensive and does have a higher heart rate. So our next question is, what is that orthostatic data, um, which she recently had brought with her, luckily? Uh, recently captured and brought with her to clinic. Um, now, some of these questions, the loss of consciousness, change in weight, um, these are things that I'm asking. Uh, we all have our sort of list of additional symptoms that we want to ask. I want to make sure this isn't vasovagal syncope, this isn't um, something endocrinological, adrenal failure, um, something to, to that extent. The thyroid, we see muscle twitching quite a bit um, in thyroid disorders. And then in her prior workup, um, we see the BUN, um, mild dehydration, hemoglobin normal, a hair low. Um, you know, she uh, was ill recently, had a C-section, eating less meat, um, but her B12 and TSH are normal. So overall, I would say um, pretty reassuring basic, basic blood work. Um, sleep is poor, high stress, poor hydration, all things that are going to send your autonomic nervous system into panic mode or fight or flight, right? Um, eating well, um, and she obviously was very well conditioned from a cardiovascular status before pregnancy. Um, and she works in retail. So hint, hint, she is on her feet for probably a long duration. Um, and so it's really going to be, it's, it's reached a point for her where it's untenable for her to continue in her job and her boss is maybe had a discussion with her about missing work or needing frequent breaks to sit down so that she can feel better. So her job might be on the line here. 
Now, again, we see those orthostatics that have increased by uh, 30 plus beats from supine to standing. And she just brought those from home. That wasn't even yet the tilt te test yet. Um, but, uh, you know, at this point, uh, no shock that we're looking at uh, POTS diagnosis here. And the treatment plan that we would create with her um, would look something like wanting to pick a medication that would be less vasodilatory, uh, would carry, uh, because she's already living in the 110s, 120s, we don't really need to bottom her out anymore. Uh, we are also looking for something that is not necessarily going to sedate her um, or cause any more fatigue. She has a young baby at home. She's probably up at all hours. Um, we don't want her necessarily sleeping through the night um, or, or missing a crying baby or a safety event, even though we do want to promote her sleep, of course. Um, and, you know, she wants to get back to long distance running. She's an athlete. And so she really is going to work hard to get that heart rate back up um, to, you know, to her max capacity. So for her, I chose Evabradine. Um, It's sort of the cleanest medication. She's not taking any other medications. Um, so that would be contributing to prolonged QT. Um, I did get an EKG and she had a normal QT interval. And so we initiated Evabradine, uh, five milligrams twice a day. Um, and she really, um, responded well to that, was able to get back to training on her own. Again, as an athlete, she felt comfortable training on her own, how to capture her target heart rate, et cetera, um, how to calculate her, her maximum target heart rate. And then for some of the non-pharmacological interventions, we really just worked on water intake. Um, I always tell my patients to get those water bottles that have the um, hourly marker indicated on them, drinking this much by 9 a.m., this much by 10 a.m., this much by 11 a.m., and that was really effective for her in promoting. She also had set her Apple Watch to promote um, water breaks, so hydrating better, um, to, again, to expand that volume, even though her volume itself isn't the problem in POTS, right, and we saw her good blood pressures, but just feeling better with drinking more water. Um, and she wore compression hose at work, which was really, really helpful for her. I also did write her a letter um, asking her um, management if instead of uh, two 15 minute breaks and a lunch break, could she have um, several 10 minute breaks throughout the day, um, which was very, um, which to which they were very agreeable, luckily. Um, but once she started training, um, when she got her endurance back up, it was really sort of a, a non-issue for her at work. So she felt more secure with, with her job as well. These are my references. And I wanted to thank you today for spending this time with me and learning all about postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. I have faith in you that you will manage your patients very well, and I have faith that they will do very well. Thank you for your time.